Welcome back to the Freight Waves 3PL Summit. I'm Mike Bowdendistel, the market expert at Freight Waves following the railroad and intermodal industries. And I'm joined today by Doug Punzel. Doug is the president of Celtic International. Uh, Celtic is an intermodal marketing company based in Chicago that was acquired by TransPlace in 2011. Uh, Doug has more than three decades of experience in the transportation industry and joined Celtic in 2014 to help lead the company's entry into the Mexico cross-border uh, intermodal uh, market. Prior to Celtic, Doug was the intermodal sales uh, division lead at Schneider National, um, which is, a, of course, a big domestic uh, truckload-based uh, intermodal uh, company. Um, Doug, thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. Thank you, Mike. I look forward to getting to spend some time with you. Great. Uh, Doug, what are you seeing in the marketplace right now? Um, you know, I know it's been a tough spring with volumes, but are you seeing, you know, signs of recovery and, and some positive uh, signs out there? Uh, we did see things bottom out in uh, April, and really since the third week of April, we've uh, improved slightly week over week. Um, we have seen certain markets uh, start to come back. Uh, California is extremely busy right now. Uh, South Texas, as well as uh, Mexico, all have uh, seen a, a nice surge in volume. Uh, as far as competitiveness with trucks, all those markets are uh, are generally having uh, problems finding trucks. So uh, we certainly are seeing greater demand for intermodal in that in, the, in that case. That's good. So you're seeing some signs of recovery. And uh, what's your expectation for getting closer to 2019 or even 2018 levels? How long do you think that will take? And, and what's your outlook going forward for volume? Um, I think, um, you know, if you listen to the, uh, the forecasters, uh, they are still expecting uh, the balance of this year that Intermodal won't, won't get back to last year's levels, uh, let alone 2018. Uh, however, I think it, uh, you know, I, I think that it will uh, probably come closer than uh, initial expectations, but we're somewhere in the double digit down. Uh, we're seeing, you know, last couple of weeks, uh, overall intermodals down, you know, from the railroad reports, we see anywhere from two to 6%. Uh, a month ago, that was 10 to 15% uh, based uh, if you looked at the prior year. So we, you know, I think, um, you know, just looking at our business, we beat last year's volume for week 25. So, um, you know, we certainly have hopes to uh, get back on track and uh, um, at least uh, get close to last year's numbers. It's good. That sounds like, you know, you're seeing some signs of improvement there. Um, when you take a little bit of a longer term perspective, I mean, intermodal has been, you know, thought of as being, a, you know, an avenue for growth in the transportation industry, um, you know, really grew a lot faster than other sectors for a long time, grew a lot faster than GDP for a long time. But really, the past four or five years, there hasn't been much uh, intermodal volume growth. And wondering uh, what your expectations are going forward. Can intermodal sort of get its mojo back and, and become uh, the growth avenue again in, in, in transportation? And, and what needs to happen in order for that to occur? And I think some of that uh, stagnant uh, growth within intermodal, some of it's been driven by the railroad uh, choice to uh, reduce and eliminate some lanes, some areas of coverage. I, I think all that is behind us now. In the time I've worked uh, in this business, most customers understand uh, you know, an additional transit day or two, but they really need reliability. And I would say in 2016 and 17, uh, reliability suffered, and that really certain that really hurt the, our ability to convert customers and get them to use intermodal. Or if they did use it, they were un, unhappy with the service and would would uh, jump right back into the over the road uh, world. You mentioned uh, railroad service, and, and railroad service I think has been a has been a bright point here lately. Um, you know, how much of that do you that stronger uh, railroad service can, would you attribute to volumes being down a couple years in a row versus um, you know investments that the railroads have made, and, and just you know, do you think that strong railroad service is sustainable um, in an environment where volumes are, are growing again? Certainly, our uh, our hope is uh, we'll start to see uh, intermodal grow at a, a faster pace than we've seen the last three or four years. In a large part, the railroads had uh, uh, made some changes to their network in 2016 and 17. Uh, they reduced the number of lanes served or the number of locations that they served. 
and uh, that that has had an impact on our uh, overall volumes on the in the model. But uh, we are seeing that uh, uh, much. Uh, Different today, uh, the railroads actually are bringing back lanes that uh, they had canceled. And so we expect uh, a um, maybe not the, as fast a pace as it was in the early uh, 2000s, but uh, uh, a, a better than GDP pace going forward. Yeah, you know, one of the, the positives I think um, lately, last year or two, has been rail service. Um, you know, rail service has been truck-like, um, which I think is, think is a, a, you know, maybe the best compliment you can give intermodal service. Um, you know, just sort of going forward, if if volumes were to recover to say 2018 levels or, or, or beyond, do you think those strong intermodal service levels will continue, or do you think we'd have a degradation there? Uh, certainly our hope is that they'll uh, continue. We've seen a uh, great improvement in rail service. Uh, they're, they're setting records now. And certainly, uh, you, you know, some folks may be skeptical uh, based on uh, volumes that that's what's driving it. But I, I do think the railroads have focused in on uh, providing greater reliability, making commitments to uh, uh, pick up or move the train out at a certain time and arrive at a certain time. And we've seen the, that even at the even throughout last year was much better than we'd seen for three or four years. You do a lot of uh, loads that go cross border from Mexico to the U.S., and we've seen Mexico really grow tremendously in terms of just becoming a manufacturing center. Um, you know, how do those loads differ from just domestic, you know, U.S. loads? Are there any sort of special requirements or um, you know things that make those loads more challenging? Um, you know, once we get that business going, it really is um, very close to moving a load domestically. Uh, you do have to uh, 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 do some uh, customs work and, and, and change the uh, forwarder but, uh, uh, and location. But other than that, uh, and we've seen, and our customers have seen great benefit from using the cross-border product. Uh, the train doesn't stop at the, at the border, we're able to uh, generally be a, a faster transit time than over the road as in getting in and out of uh, Mexico. And it's allowed uh, our customers in Mexico uh, great access to capacity. And, you know, we do quite a bit with the various electronics and appliances and CPG companies uh, within Mexico. And, uh, you know, there's a a, a big demand for that uh, today, and that we expect going forward. Yeah, you uh, you're a non-asset based company, but uh, you know shipping intermodal loads requires getting a container from from some place. Uh, you know, can you talk about how those containers are you know accessed and um, the availability of containers currently? Yes, Mike. Uh, one of the things that we view uh, uh, the way we look at it is when we're using the railroad asset that uh, becomes our asset. And uh, we have access to 70,000 rail boxes. When we have it on the street, we want to reuse it. So we look at it like a, an asset provider. We work with our draymen to do um, reloads, and uh, it gives us, uh, us and our customers some reliability. However, there's many times that we need additional equipment, and we use the reservation system powered by Bloom that all the railroads use. And it gives us uh, access to um, uh, equipment in the market. Clearly, the equipment today is in good supply, uh, with the exception of a few markets. And, uh, you know, we've, we also have access to uh, hundreds of thousands of 40-foot containers, which is, is also a value to our customers, particularly that ship uh, heavy items uh, from the Midwest and uh, Memphis and those areas back to the West Coast. Doug, have there been any uh, customer synergies between uh, TransPlace and, and Celtic? Um, you know, maybe customers that did not use intermodal previously, and, and you know, you've, have, you know, you've converted to, to intermodal. And, and if so, just sort of how sticky has that process been? Have they stay, have they stuck with intermodal? You know, one one of the things that we try to do is work with uh, TransPlace customers that uh, um, and and provide them options and provide them value. And uh, you know, many times rail, uh, intermodal can provide uh, cost savings, so that's something that uh, uh, our customers value. And as long as uh, reliability is there, which we've seen from uh, 
the railroads in the last uh, uh, 18 months, uh, it's a much easier product for our, our customers to use. Uh, so we've had great success uh, uh, converting uh, over the road to intermodal in the last uh, uh, few years. And many times it's from a customer that just doesn't have either any experience or, or positive uh, experience in using intermodal. You have relationship with, relationships with all the class one railways. Um, for an intermodal marketing company, how common is that and what uh, unique advantages does that give you at Celtic? We think it's fairly uncommon and we do think it uh, gives us two advantages. The first uh, being that uh, particularly within the East, uh, it's important uh, you know where the where the customers are located and where the ramp, rail ramps are are uh, located is very critical. A lot of times you're dealing with short haul moves anywhere from five to eight hundred miles, and uh, if you're closer to the ramp, uh, um, it can be more effective. And then Norfolk Southern and the CSX uh, have locations that vary, and uh, we like to use both because it gives us uh, us and our customers both options. Uh, the second uh, reason, it's great to have uh, solid relationships with all the railroads. Uh, occasionally, there's a, a derailment or uh, a, a tunnel outage or some other kind of outage that causes uh, problems, and we have uh, a great relationship with all of them that allows us to uh, work back and forth as needed. That's great. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you also, I mean, one of the things that we've seen in uh, the freight waves data that we have in Sonar lately is the domestic uh, intermodal volume has surged lately um, in a manner similar to some of the long haul trucking. Um, while the international intermodal volume, you know, those moving in 40 foot containers have sort of leveled out or fallen. So there's two, you know, segments of the intermodal market have, have gone in different directions. I'm just wondering, um, you know, what you're seeing in the marketplace and, you know, are, are you seeing that? And, and you know, how would you sort of explain those two um, data points, domestic and international intermodal going in, in different directions? Yeah, I think uh, some of that uh, has been driven by, you know, significant retailers were closed for two months and uh, canceled their orders from overseas. So they were not uh, moving uh, 40, they were not uh, taking international boxes in for that period of time. And during that period of time, there was a lot less uh, cross uh, dock business and uh, activity uh, close to the ports, which is a fairly common thing today where um, 40s come in, they're transloaded onto 53s. That's generally where we come in, moving that product across country. For two months, that really didn't happen uh, in either mode. We're starting to see the 53s come back today uh, we're also starting to see some of our retailers put in orders, and you'll see those uh, uh, shipments start to come uh, to fruition in the next, uh, you know, three, four weeks. We'll start to see some of that in the international volume pick up. That makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, thanks, Doug. Uh, you know, we are out of time, but I just want to thank you, uh, Doug Punzel at, at Celtic uh, Inter International, uh, for joining us today. That was really, um, you know, insightful. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it.